My name is Mark Williams. I'm uh, the chair of the political science department here at Middlebury College, and I would like to welcome you to uh, the symposium on Korea. Uh, I'd also like to introduce to you our speaker this afternoon, Professor David Kang. David is a professor of government at Dartmouth College, our neighbor. He's also an adjunct professor at the business um, school of uh, business, the Tuck School of Business there in Hanover. David has authored uh, several books. The most recent is China Rising, Peace, Power, and Order in East Asia. He's also written a book called Crony Capitalism, Corruption and Development in South Korea and the Philippines, and is a co-editor for, excuse me, co-author for a book uh, entitled Nuclear North Korea, a debate on engagement strategies. Besides writing books, David has written a number of articles and he's published in such venues as International Organization and International Security. Uh, he writes op-eds, he writes commentary that appear in the Financial Times and other periodicals. And that's just what he does in his spare time. What David is really known for, and what he does not want me to tell you, <laughs> He is known for uh, being the owner of a 1965 Mustang. <laughs> Very sweet. Little rust because it uh, resided in California. In California. Uh, he is also uh, known for his incredible command of uh, California yeast. Um, he introduced me to the lexicon of how to speak Californian. Words like gnarly. <laughs> didn't know what that meant. Grody. Yeah, he explained all of these things to me uh, thoroughly. And he's also known for being an excellent jazz keyboardist. This is true. And when he's not writing books, when he is ostensibly doing research uh, abroad, he is actually cutting jazz CDs. <laughs> <laughs> he's quite proficient at this. Uh, David comes to us, uh, as I said, from Dartmouth College, and the title of his talk this afternoon is North Korea, What We Know and What We Wish to Know. Please join me in welcoming David Kane. Thank you, Mark. I first met Mark when we were both in grad, grad school, and we were uh, summer interns at, at Rand out in L.A., which was... An awesome, awesome time. It was awesome. Mark and I were uh, office mates. So we go back a long way. A long way. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I do have the word nuclear in there. Sorry. I do have the word nuclear in the, in the title. Um, thank you all for, very much for coming. I see I am kicking off the uh, week of North Korea, the North Korea week here. So hopefully I will set up... Uh, the big speakers who are coming tomorrow and, and Thursday in particular. And when I was talking with Danielle about what to do, what we figured is probably the best thing to do for the first guy uh, is to sort of set a stage, which is why this is the, the topic that we're going to do. Um, and basically, this is a picture of South Africa somewhere, right, of a, of a 10 minute South Africa. And the reason I start with this picture is we often have very, very bad ideas about what uh, North Korea actually looks like. And, you know, it could be people living in garbage dumps. Uh, I usually put up a picture of Afghanistan or something like that, right? Because there are basically two images that we see of North Korea. Uh, guys in lab coats, soldiers marching. And in fact, I was, I was doing a, actually a TV interview one time. And I was doing it remote, so I was just talking to a camera, and I say, you know, there's an awful lot about North Korea we don't know. The only thing that we ever see on TV is guys in lab coats and, and guys marching. And I watched the tape later, and sure enough, while I was talking, there's a picture of guys marching through the square. <laughs> right? So I guarantee any time you turn on CNN or, or Fox News or whatever else, these are the images you're going to see. And they are images of North Korea. You're going to learn a lot more over the next couple of days about North Korean human rights and the nuclear issue and things like that. But what, one thing that I find particularly difficult in the United States is uh, getting any kind of a real picture of what North Korea looks like, what North Korean people are, because there actually are people up there. So uh, this is another image we have. Well, everybody know who this guy is? Kim Jong-il. Uh, right? this, is, this is after the first meeting between Kim and uh, the South Korean leader in 2000. And 
people were so surprised that he actually was able to put, form coherent sentences that they, you know, they, they, uh, they put this up, right? Greetings, everything. So, Economist is hilarious. But, so what I thought I would do is actually just, at, at first, we'll, we'll do a little slideshow and, and have some pictures of, of what North Korea looks like because very few people have any idea, right? Uh, they're very crappy cement blocks, uh, but this could be any city in, in East Asia, anywhere, these, these concrete towers, uh, apartment buildings. Uh, factory, this is Pyongyang at night. Uh, this is the Taedong River. Uh, Pyongyang is actually a city of about one and a half million people. It's actually fairly large. There's another picture of the city. Uh, it's not bombed out rubble. It's a nicer city than the countryside, of course, but most cities are. Here's the countryside. One of the things that happens, you know who has the best access to North Korea is Russians. Most of these pictures are taken by Russian tourists, because if you're American or you're South Korean, you go, they, they want to make sure that you only take the photos they want you to take. Russian tourists go and they get all these amazing photos of, of sort of village life and things. So uh, here are some other pictures. Uh, this is probably the same as it was 100 years ago. Uh, people pushing carts. Uh, this is little boys uh, doing uh, ice skating, so to speak. And what I think is so fascinating about that, I'll tell you something personal. Uh, my father was born in North Korea. And he, he, he actually, I have a picture at home where he drew, uh, he was, before this picture came out, he would say, oh, when we were kids, we would take a block of wood and two sticks and we'd go around. You know? And then I saw this picture, I was like, wow, nothing has changed in 70 years. You know? That's what they still do. This is one of the things we uh, don't know as much about is that North Korea has continued to cooperate with the United States in certain areas throughout the uh, nuclear crisis. One of those is in searching for remains of U.S. soldiers who were killed in action during the Korean War, 1950. So here what we have is throughout the nuclear crisis, U.S. military personnel have been going to uh, North Korea and looking for the remains of uh, killed in action soldiers. Uh, this is from this year. Right there, uh, this guy is my friend Victor that I wrote the North Korea book with. He was the national security director uh, under Bush for the last three years. So that's him and Bill Richardson bringing back the remains of some U.S. kill in action soldiers. This is an interesting thing. What these, uh, see this little plastic jungle gym or whatever you want to call it, a little thing? These houses there, a uh, little playground, swing set. Here's another picture. Uh, this was given by a South Korean uh, church, actually a very conservative South Korean church. They didn't give any money to North Korea, but what they did do is they said, we have to, you know, after unification, North Koreans are going to look at us and say, you knew we were starving, what did you do? So we refused to give any money to the regime, but we gave money to build new houses in uh, Hamgyong province, which is a little south of Pyongyang. And then they went and actually were able to check that the houses were built. A couple more pictures and we'll get on to stuff. What's interesting about this Bonghak beer, the uh, Korean beer? What's interesting about this beer? We have it in our fraternities. Yeah. <laughs> What? I, I think I heard it. What, what is interesting about this? It's in English, right? They have an English label here. Uh, interestingly enough, in 1995, English replaced Russian as the mandatory foreign language in high school. Which tells you there are, there's a, a lot of stuff going on under the surface that we don't tend to see in the, in the United States. Uh, in many ways, North Korea knows which way the wind is blowing. Here is a, a Huiparam. Uh, whisper car assembled by Moonies. Uh, the Reverend Sun Young Moon was actually born in North Korea. He has actually built a plant in North Korea to assemble these cars and then re-export them out. Uh, clearly, these North Korean guys are probably not affording the car anytime soon. <laughs> but uh, there are cars being built and advertisement in North Korea. Just a couple more. Here's uh, some of the markets. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, but in 2002, the uh, North Korean government abandoned the centrally planned economy. Up until that time, basically prices were dictated by, there were no prices, they were just quotas were dictated. Uh, since that time, they've allowed uh, supply and demand to set most of the prices. Uh, inevitably, there has been 5,000% uh, inflation, certain goods, uh, things like that. We will talk about that more. 
a little bit more stuff here. This is uh, reconnecting the railroad, uh, the, the roads through the demilitarized zone. I used to say going to the DMZ is one of the most amazing things you can ever do. Has anybody been up there to the DMZ? Right. Up until probably about five or six years ago, it was genuinely a somber experience because nobody had been through the DMZ in 50 years. And in fact, the DMZ right now is a uh, amazing Northeast Asian wildlife preserve because it's one of the few places in Japan, Korea, and China that has not been developed. So I used to say, you've got to go see it. Uh, you go back now, it's totally different. One thing that they have done is they've reconnected the uh, uh, roads and the railroads through the DMZ for this uh, Kaesong Industrial Zone, which is using South Korean money and North Korean workers. Uh, here's the uh, Industrial Zone. It's on the north side, so if you ever go to the DMZ, you can see that flag. That's a North Korean flag. This is actually from the northern side, which is very cool. I went there this summer. Uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and uh, one thing that's interesting about it is, of course, they're ju they've just started the building, and they have these massively uh, uh, ambitious plans to expand it out. And everybody is very skeptical about whether they, they can do that or not. Uh, the only thought that I had, it was a gut reaction though, is that this is the same kind of skepticism that greeted South Koreans when they said we're going to build the world's largest uh, steel plant and the shipbuilding and everything else. So I wouldn't necessarily bet against a South Korean economy if I were you. Anyway, here's the, uh, here's the actual uh, north-south uh, 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 immigration customs zone, which is, again, something you did not see up until they opened up this up, where you actually go through customs to go from North and South Korea. It's pretty amazing. So a lot is changing underneath the surface. This is hilarious, anyway. Uh, uh, in uh, in uh, 2005, they reconnect, North and South Korea reconnected telephone lines, 300 telephone lines to go to this, to this place. The first time you had telephone lines uh, between North and South Korea since the Korean War. Now, interestingly enough, there is this island, this uninhabited rocks that nobody cares about between Japan and Korea, uh, that they always are fighting over who really owns the islands. Well, one thing North and South Korea can agree on is that those are Korean islands. They're called Tokdo. <laughs> so if you'll notice, the phone lines go, if you can read Korean, they go from this Kaesong Industrial Zone to these uninhabited islands. <laughs> Nobody lives at. <laughs> I just think that's amazing, right? <laughs> Nobody lives there, a bunch of seagulls, you know? But, uh, those are Korean islands. Don't forget it. Um, all right, last one. Uh, the, the, the athletic teams have marched together under a unification flag. That's the uh, Korean, the Korean uh, uh, peninsula in blue. So there's a lot of other stuff that we don't tend to see when we focus purely on the, um, uh, purely on the, uh, the images that you're going to see in the United States. There's 22 million people there. Uh, one thing that I, I like to do is say, uh, what's the size of the United States economy? Does anybody know the GDP? Wow, you guys are pretty good. I do this at Tuck, and, and I, people say, I don't know, 400? People have no idea. $13 trillion, size of the U.S. economy. World's second largest economy is Japan. What's the size of Japan's economy? Yeah, about 4 or $5 trillion, right? South Korea's economy is about a trillion dollars. Size of North Korea's economy, we estimate? <laughs> Probably about $40 billion. $40 billion. Now, that's very hard to compare $40 billion with a trillion or $13 trillion. To put it in comparison, the, the uh, New Hampshire state product is about $68 billion. So New Hampshire produces probably about double what, what a North Korea does as a country. Uh, and since you guys live here, you know there's nothing here but trees. So North Korea is very small, but that doesn't mean it can't be a big problem. So for the next, I don't know, 20 or, or 30 minutes or so, I'll talk, try and give you a bit of an overview of, of those issues. And then hopefully there will be plenty of time for us to talk about anything you want to. Because uh, one of the things about North Korea is there are so many interesting issues involved. There's just so much to get your hands around. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is ignore the cartoon. It's basically talking about this vice minister's meeting between North and South Korea. And the North Korean side is saying, if you're hungry, wait a bit because South Korea is going to engage with us. So, you know, there's essentially three things that we care about in terms of North Korea. Right? 
nuclear weapons, human rights, and a distant third, for some reason, is this economic reform and opening. Certainly in the United States, that's the, the priorities. Right? And it's very easy for people to start talking about this, that, or the other thing. But basically, these are the three issues that we care about with regard to North Korea. Uh, how you prioritize those, we'll talk about maybe later. But here's the thing, right? No matter, and, and there's huge controversy over how to deal with North Korea. People debate all the time and, and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. It's important to remember that almost everybody agrees on the goals with respect to North Korea. The disagreement is not about what we want, which is that North Korea changes its ways, modifies its ways, or it changes completely. The disagreement is not there. Everybody wants to do that. The question is really, what's the best way to get North Korea to change? Some people think that coercion, using threats and sticks, how dare we? You know, you don't negotiate with evil, you defeat it. There is a, there is a very uh, you know, strong element here in the United States, in South Korea, that says there's, you know, they have been a crime and punishment strategy, they have done things wrong, hit them until they, until they come back into line. The other side thinks that engagement, more... Uh, searching for interdependence between North Korea and South Korea or the world, uh, and various carrots can draw North Korea out. And this debate is, has, you know, has gone back and forth even under the Bush administration. We have seen uh, U.S. policy shift back and forth between these two extremes, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle here, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But it's important to remember the first part. Everybody agrees on the goals. That's not the question. The hard part is not what do we think North Korea would we'd like it to be. The hard part is how do you actually get a country to change. So what I'm going to do is give you a bit of an overview here, which is I think the key question regarding North Korea in almost any of these, but certainly with regard to the nuclear question, is this. Do they have legitimate security concerns or not? In other words, does North Korea face a threat? Do they feel threatened, particularly by the United States, also with other countries, right? Now, you'll get a lot of disagreement about this, right? Uh, how could they possibly feel threatened by us? We wouldn't do anything. Right? On the one hand, if no, if North Korea does not feel threatened and does not think that the United States would use force to, to uh, uh, implement regime change or to coerce it in some way, right? which it is quite possible that many of us say, well, look, we would never do that. If no... Then they are blackmailing us. There's no question about it. And they are using nuclear threats and, and uh, you know, human rights deprivations and whatever else. They are using that to get things from the United States and the world community, and they are using it as brinksmanship and as a ploy. On the other hand, if North Korea does feel security threats, then without resolving those security threats, we're not going to make any progress. In other words, if North Korea feels threatened, then threatening them is unlikely to make them feel less threatened. And that comes down to the crux. In other words, to me, the key analytic question is this, and where you come down on this largely is going to determine what you think is the best strategy with North Korea. If you think they don't face a threat and they're making it up, then probably you should hit them. If they do face threats, then you have to deal with those threats. A lot of people disagree. The book that I wrote, we had a, we had a very interesting debate about how this, how this plays out. Okay. So, what is the key issue? To my mind, there is essentially one key issue, which is that the pacing of how we do this. I've got a slide coming up in a little bit. Uh, but what the United States has historically said since basically the early 1990s is, all right, you guys are out of line with world community norms, with everything else. Come back into line. You disarm first. Prove to us that you're not a dangerous rogue. And we have a whole bunch of goodies that we can give you. Normalization, economic ties. Uh, Japan is willing to pay some reparations for World War II. But you've got to disarm first and prove to us that you're not a threat. What North Korea says is, well, we don't trust you either. So why don't we do that precisely the other way around? <laughs> How about if you stop threatening us first, and then we're happy to disarm, but there's no way we're going to disarm and trust you. And hence, essentially, we have been stuck in stalemate. 
it'll be very interesting to see right now in the next six months whether we have really moved beyond that or not. But uh, the, the record of the last, basically the record of the last 15 years or so has been this. And even right now as we talk about what's going on, which I will conclude with, there has been a question about who goes first. You've got to prove to us that you're not uh, threatening. So I, I have a couple, more, a couple more things here. There are two key points. Not everything is key. Most things. <laughs> the first one is this, which is very easy for us to overlook, which is North Korea is not erratic at all. North Korea is actually very consistent in its behavior. And North Korea does this. They meet pressure with pressure of their own. This is the most consistent behavior that you can see out of North Korea. We start threatening them, they threaten back. We do something to them, they ratchet up the pressure. The second key point, this is also very easy to forget, they don't trust us any more than we trust them. And I guarantee you, right now in North Korea, there is uh, a seminar going on. With, um, in North Korea right now, in Pyongyang, people are saying, is the United States going to live up to what it said it would do? And we can talk about that, but they, they don't trust us any more than we trust them. And we are stuck, for those of you who take IR from Professor Williams, we are stuck in a security dilemma. Um, in any case, so, one thing I find very interesting about this, though, and this is in stark contrast, I put this up too quick. This is in stark contrast to a number of the other issues that the United States faces today. Iran, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, a bunch of these very important issues that the United States faces. There is no agreement about anything. So, uh, what's his name? Uh, Medina Jad comes to the, uh, to the UN. He doesn't agree on whether there's a nuclear problem, what to do about it, etc. Palestine, Israel, nobody agrees on anything. One thing that is very different about the North Korean crisis compared to these crises is that actually there's a fair amount of agreement on both the, uh, the problem and the solution. Since 1994, both North Korea and the United States have essentially agreed on the terms, which is they, they say, all right, we will give up our nuclear weapons, provided that the U.S. normalizes relations and opens trade. And both sides have agreed this. They agreed it in writing in 1994. They, re they rewrote it basically in 2005. And then we did it again this year. Now, this is actually a very important point. The, uh, going back to you know, the, 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 the key problem, which was we say, okay, we all agree on this. You do yours first, and then we will do our second. But even so, there is more of a path to a solution on the Korean Peninsula than there is in a number of these other situations. Like, you ask me how to solve the Iran problem? I don't really have any idea. Even if I knew something, I wouldn't have any idea. <laughs> I don't know anything about the Middle East. But, you know, these are issues where nobody agrees on it. In North Korea and the United States, there is basic agreement on the cause of the problem, which is nuclear weapons and U.S. Uh, the war, the 1950 war, and on the solution, which is nukes for normalization. It is, it is broken down, of course, over these implementation issues. So, why, and here I think is a, is a very good example of this more recently, uh, what's, a, what's an example of this is the, the highly enriched uranium controversy, which is that there have been, in 1994, we came to an agreement over the, the, uh, uh, the plant that North Korea had, which was a plutonium-based uh, nuclear plant in this place called Yongbyon. Came to some agreement. It broke down in 2002, essentially because what the United States did is we said, North Korea, you have a highly enriched uranium. You have a different type of a plant. It's the same type of a, uh, a program that uh, Iran is using right now, where what you do is you take centrifuges, and you spin things around, and you can get highly enriched uranium to make a bomb. We said, actually, officially, we think that you can have nuclear weapons from this uranium plant by, mids, by mid-decade, which was two years ago. Now, I, and here's, here's where I actually am, am, am I have to say, I, I take uh, uh, blame, or I, I, I was cowed frankly, in 2002, uh, in the current climate, I took it at face value. And so I said, okay, they do have it, you know, it's and worked from there. Well, last year, actually, I was in D.C. and we're doing some things, and two different people who had been at those meetings, one was a senior director for the NSC and another one was uh, uh, Colin Powell's chief of staff, were, were saying these things, started to say, actually, all that we knew is they had bought 30 centrifuges. 
Iran has 3,000 centrifuges running full-time, and they think it'll take about five years to make enough money, uh, uranium for a bomb. And these guys said, we knew between 20 and 32 centrifuges were bought. That's all we knew. And from that, we extrapolated this. And then, of course, it started to come out in, in, in print that everyone was basically backing off of the, you have a second plant that's up and running that will get nukes by, this mid by mid-decade. So I was cowed. Uh, but now here's the real issue. The, the issue is still, what did they do with this? But the first thing to note is that we are very, very good at sort of taking, we don't trust North Korea at all. So you can hear this and you can extrapolate all the way out. That doesn't mean they're innocent by any stretch of the imagination. But we have certainly been prone to exaggerating uh, what we actually really factually knew versus what we sort of suspected. And so the uh, HU controversy... Uh, came out in 2002. North Korea, essentially the, the details of this are still very murky from the people who were there at the meeting. Uh, some Americans claim that North Korea admitted it and then said, what are you going to do about it? Uh, North Korea says they never admitted they have a second uh, uh, plan. In any case, U.S. then said, you broke the, this uh, agreement over the, over the first, over the plutonium reactor. We're cutting off, we're stopping what we did. And North Korea said, we didn't, do it. We didn't break the agreement at all. You broke the agreement. So they restarted their reactor, and we began to go into a, basically a five-year spiral of a tit-for-tat in the, in the wrong way. So we've had these talks, these six-party talks between, uh, that's Jim Kelly, I can't remember the rest, <laughs> U.S., US and, and North Korea and South Korea, U.S. and China, uh, Russia and Japan. Six parties uh, have basically been negotiating over the uh, uh, nuclear uh, issue in North Korea since then. We have gone between various kinds of threats or not. And in the past year, this sort of North Korea meets pressure with pressure. They meet a kind word for a kind word, whatever you want to call it is. Uh, in September 19, 2005, we finally got back to a set of agreements which roughly looked like the first agreement signed in 1994, which is very hard in the per current political climate because that first agreement had been totally abrogated, meaning, or not abrogated, what's the word? It had been abrogated, but uh, denigrated as being you know, appeasing dictators and selling out to terrorists and everything else. So it's very hard for the administration to go back to that. But they did. We agreed in principle to do basically the same thing, nukes for normalization. Literally the next week, the Treasury Department accused North Korea of laundering money through Banco Delta Asia. This turned into a huge fiasco, which if you're interested, I have a bunch of links to most of this stuff on my website. Uh, turned into a huge fiasco. Eventually it turns out we said, okay, you can have the money back. We still think you're evil, but uh, we're not really sure that this was really bad money. We had to send it back to a bank. But we did that the week after we signed the agreement, which is one reason North Koreans don't trust us. So North Korea tested a missile and tested a nuclear weapon. Uh, we then started talking about uh, other things that we could do. And meeting pressure with pressure in this case was leading both, it's, you know, the whatever, you know, it's a game of chicken, both cars driving at each other, two guys grappling on the edge of a cliff. Whatever analogy you want to use, we basically had a choice of keep ratcheting up things and start a war or find another way out. So in uh, January of this year, about 11 months, 10 months ago, uh, Victor and Chris Hill went and had the first bilateral meeting between the U.S. and North Korea since under the Bush administration. We ended up with this agreement in, in February 13, 2007, which, surprise, surprise, said basically nukes for normalization. Where we are right now, last week in uh, Beijing, the six parties met, uh, and they sort of agreed. North Korea said by the end of the year, it will uh, allow in AI, AI, International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors. Actually, U.S. guys are supposed to go over the border, I think, uh, sometime this week. Uh, they will freeze and disable this plutonium reactor uh, and a bunch of other reactors. And the key thing that everyone in America is focused like a laser beam on is they're going to list all the nuclear sites. Because we want to know what's really up with this uranium program. I sometimes wonder how much of a, of a red herring that is, because I'm not convinced you know, that there's really a second program. And what I think this does is this leaves a sort of window of uh, uh, ambiguity for backing out at any point if we're not satisfied with the way things are going. The U.S. will remove North Korea from the terrorist des designation uh, the terrorist list, you can't, it's not just like, um, you know, erasing it from a hard drive. There's a series of steps that have to be done. We've started that. 
we've concluded BDA and given the money back. Uh, and we've, started, we've, we've said, once this stuff is done, we're happy to normalize relations, and there's working groups set up about security initiatives and uh, peace treaties and everything else. So actually, the last year has seen a tremendous amount of progress, having worked backwards for the previous six years. So we are roughly at the same place we were about 2000, other than North Korea has now tested a nuclear weapon and tested a missile. So... Uh, Roughly, that's where we are, and it goes back to these points. Even now, I, I, am, I, am, I guarantee you, actually, I was going to say reasonably sure, I guarantee you that the issues of who goes first is going to come up you know, in the next three months or next year or something like that, right? You, normalize, you, you de disarm first, and then we've got all these goodies. North Korea will say, hold on a second here. You, you, show, you, know, you, give us, you show some goodwill first, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So, other issues? I focus more on the nuclear issue. Uh, you know, one thing that I, that I think that is overlooked, actually, is the economic side. Interestingly enough, in the United States, we care about nuclear weapons and we care about the human rights issue. And I think both are very important. But one thing that South Korea has done, and I haven't focused on it here because we're in, we're in the United States, uh, is that they have focused on an engagement strategy that basically tries to change North behavior by wrapping them in, saturating them with capitalism by opening markets, by trying to change North Korean mindsets. And the goal is that over time, you will actually open up North Korea enough that you can change uh, the, the regime from below. That's one reason I spent so much time in the picture section talking about uh, all, all the economic changes. Because what we tend to ignore in the United States is how much North Korea is different today than it was in 1994 or 10 years ago. The North Korea of today is not the North Korea of, of 1994. It's by no means an uh, open economy, even like to say the way that China is. But it has begun down that path. And it's a good thing to remember that China took 30 years to get to where it is today. It's still a communist authoritarian regime. One thing that's vastly different, though, is that China has opened up its economy. Many, many people's views are different, even within China itself. And it's unrealistic to expect North Korea to do that in like two years or something. But there's no question they can move down one path and it'll probably be very hard for them to move back off of this very tentative economic opening that they've done. So, what about uh, human rights or illicit activities? These, these issues, you're going you're to hear a lot about this over the next couple days, so I don't want to talk about it too much. And I guess there's a, a, um, a documentary tonight, the CNN documentary. Right? Right? One, one question to, to, to keep in the back of your minds, the same question arises about human rights. There is no doubt. Nobody, as I said, nobody is defending North Korea as being, a, you know, just a misunderstood regime, right? It is a repressive authoritarian regime. That's not the issue. Nobody disagrees with that. The issue is, what do you do about it? How do you best get change in a regime like that? So regarding North Korean uh, uh, human rights and illicit activities, many of the same questions come up about do you put them under sanctions and criticize them, hit them with a stick, or do you try and work through uh, humanitarian NGOs? One thing that I've always found frustrating about a number of the, the documentaries, that I haven't seen the CNN one, but is that they point out the problem, you know, but, but you don't need a whole lot of evidence to know that living in North Korea is really, really unpleasant, right? It is far harder to point out how you're actually going to make something change in North Korea. Nobody is denying it's basically a hellhole. Uh, the question is, what do you do about it? And so hopefully Peter, Peter has been working on it. Peter Beck has been working on this stuff for a long time with the International Crisis Group. And uh, he's going to have a lot of interesting things to say. But the questions still come back to that. How do you make things better in North Korea, whether it's human rights, the economy, or on the nuclear issue? So in terms of uh, brief, brief uh, scanning to the future, uh, you know, people always ask me, am I optimistic or pessimistic, right? You know, I, I think anybody who's studied North Korea for a while learns very quickly not to be either one because it depends on so many different factors that I would have no ability to say, even after the last summit and, and all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, what I would say is, uh, oh, the second one, you know, will, will North Korea live up to its promises? Again, I am, am I optimistic? I have no idea. Will the U.S.? I have no idea. This is so dependent on so many of these very subtle things that happen. What will happen with uh, a new president in the United States? 
right? We could have a, 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 a democratic president who decides that being tough is actually a good way to go. We could have a Republican president who actually may be able to work from a position of strength better. One thing that you, you know, South Koreans uh, are, are very aware of is that any agreement made under a Republican president is more likely to endure a regime change in the United States than is a Democrat. It's just the way of foreign policy in the United States that Republicans are considered tough. So if they make a deal, they can get away with it better than a Democrat. So do I think this will, U.S. will keep up doing what it's doing? I have no idea. But I would say this, right? As a pragmatic, not optimistic or pessimistic, in the last year we have made more progress than almost anybody thought if we had gotten together in, uh, say, January of 2007, right after the missile test of the summer and the nuclear test and uh, you know, all the chest beating by everybody. In which case, you know, I think it's pretty clear that coercion doesn't work. I would say that in a pragmatic sense, we have made more progress now. Engagement with reciprocity has, has made far more progress in the last year than uh, we think, uh, than, we, you know, than we would have thought beforehand. And so as long as it's working, I would say we should push forward as hard as possible, hard as possible uh, and uh, try and make it work. So with that, I think I am out of time, and I'm happy to talk about, let's see, I think that's the end. I'm happy to talk about uh, whatever you guys would like to talk about. Thank you. The North, the North and South Korean leaders just had the second summit meeting, the second ever meeting between the leaders uh, earlier this month. Uh, lots of skepticism in South Korea, lots of skepticism in the United States. You know, my, and, and they came away with uh, uh, an agreement that was uh, I don't know, three, three pages long or something like that, where they, where they talked about doing a number of things, working towards a peace regime, uh, increasing economic uh, uh, relations between the two countries, <laughs> Uh, having a joint zone over this disputed uh, fishing area on the on the West Sea, you know, and and in a sense, I understand the skepticism. There's a lot of reasons why the uh, South Korean president wanted to do this for his legacy and everything else. Uh, on the other hand, these kinds of summits, uh, again, given the alternatives of not doing it, are probably a good way to go. Right? I mean, what we tend to forget with regard to North Korea is that even at the height of the Cold War. The U.S. and the Soviet Union had regular meetings between their leaders precisely so that they could avoid doing something stupid and in order to try and uh, talk about the issues that face them. And it doesn't seem to make any sense to me to sort of isolate North Korea and then be surprised when we don't have any idea what's going on. Particularly when I think what was interesting about that meeting was uh, Kim Jong-il, the North Korean leader, most likely was, you know, he resisted for four years under this, the South Korean president. He finally agrees, right while things are going well, when there's an impending presidential election in South Korea, when there's a uh, U.S., you know, we're, beginning, we're ramping up our presidential election. You know, in a way, you know, anything where, where Kim, where the North Korean leader is now trying to respond to even South Korean public opinion, I think is a good thing. The more that you get the North Korean leadership or the people to have to interact with the world, I think that's a positive thing. Right? So in that sense, 
I have no problem with the summit. And there was a spate of op-eds by Americans who were very skeptical. Well, we'll have to wait and see, blah, blah, blah. And I think they totally missed the point. To, to expect some kind of dramatic, actual peace treaty or something was, was totally unrealistic. But as a routine step, it would be nice if they met every year and talked about issues that were of importance. So to that sense, I don't think it's, I think, I think it was a fine meeting. I came away totally, uh, you know, that's what I expected. Is it going to dramatically change things? I don't think so. Right? It's within the context of this U.S., uh, the, the nuclear problem, that you can have progress in the Korean Peninsula. And so I think the two are, you know, sort of hand in glove. Uh, but I don't think it's a dramatic change. How about in the, in the back? You know, before you do that, can you turn off your microphone? Turn mine off? Yeah, turn off yours off and use the one. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that should make that work. Ah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, I've known that, uh, I know that North Korea has basically kicked out UN inspectors like uh, several times before. So isn't it uh, reasonable to conclude that they're going to get this nuclear weapon? And wouldn't it be a better strategy just to give them the weapon? And it might even serve like as a stabilizer in the region and try to integrate. Because I know that North Korea, is, I think, I've watched the documentary and said that it's the country with the least tourists and the least like, outside <laughs> communication. Wouldn't it be a better strategy to try to give them the weapon and then try to integrate them to the international society? Because that would kind of like, legitimize their regime, I guess, and they wouldn't make them feel so threatened. Sure. I mean, that's actually a, it's a, it's just a provocative proposal. <laughs> um, one thing, they've, they've already tested a bomb. And indications I heard from, from people in the Chinese uh, uh, government were that the North Koreans told them beforehand they expected the yield to be low, so that people were surprised that the, that the explosion was so small, actually. They thought maybe it was a mistake or something like that. But the Chinese government said they were told the day or two before that they expected the yield to be very low which means either the North Koreans are farther along with their, with their technology than we thought, or they were just sort of under, <laughs> underestimated. But they, they, evidently, they gauged it pretty well, right? So they already have a bomb. It's very clear. CIA estimates, the, estimates they have between six or eight bombs. Now, they don't have a delivery system for them. They have no missiles that can actually carry these bombs. They've never tested that well. So uh, the question is, how would they deliver this, you know, in a truck or a boat or something like that? You know? <laughs> Not very effective. Um, but the basic point, I think the point underlying your question is actually a very good one, which is, you know, how do you, how do you resolve North Korea's security concerns? And then how do you open them up? In that sense, I think the, the, the rest of the region would not probably find a North Korean nuclear weapon that stabilizing. Although, interestingly enough, the people who are most concerned about the nuclear problem are the, is the United States. Of the, of the four other countries in the Six Party Talks that I've mentioned, China and South Korea clearly rate the, pro the potential of economic collapse as more, more dangerous to them than the threat of a North Korean bomb. Japan isn't really that worried about it. They care about the abductees. Russia only cares about money. The United States is particularly concerned, not even because North Korea can hit the United States, but it's because we're worried that they will sell these bombs to terrorists who will then use them against the U.S., right? which is why there's so much concern right now over Syria and did the U.S., did North Korea really do it? Did, they, did North Korea really not help Syria build a, build a um, thing, right? So in that sense, uh, you know, Ken Waltz would say, sure, give everybody a bomb. <laughs> then everyone will be, feel safe. I don't think that in the current political climate that's probably likely. I mean, the repercussions of a nuclear war would be disastrous for like, North Korea. Absolutely. So I feel like a nuclear bomb is more like a statue, like a symbol, than it is actually a threat to any country. Well, nuclear weapons in general aren't usable, right? They're not fungible. Uh, nobody can really use them, right? What nuclear weapons are best at doing is deterring other, other countries, which is one of the, they're very poor offensive weapons. They're very poor defensive weapons. You can't really blow things up. You just obliterate things. So they're best used, they're actually nuclear weapons are most powerful when they're not used, meaning I've got a new deterrent. Even if I lose the war, I can still kill you, right? Uh, IR 101. <laughs> but... You know, so to that sense, absolutely, right? And that, and that, is, that is an argument that, that is uh, for stabilization. The thing is that I think in the current political climate it would be very hard to do. Although we, I will point out that every country in the region is essentially living with a nuclear-armed North Korea right now. And it doesn't seem to have made Japan go nuclear or Taiwan go nuclear or anything else. The, the you know, chicken little sky is falling predictions about a North Korean nuke have not been anywhere near record, realized.
Hi. This may be a really large question, but I wanted to get your opinion on what you think about the reunification of North and South Korea, mm -hmm. and also how um, that might actually compare to your father's opinion or his generation who uh -huh. um, have that direct Who lived through it, yeah, the, the, the division. You know, unification is sort of taken for granted uh, in South and North Korea, that this is what they want. No question about it, right? When will it happen? Could happen tomorrow. Could happen 50 years from now. I have no idea. Essentially, it's pretty clear how unification will occur. At some point, the North Korean regime is going to go away. There's going to be some kind of collapse up there. And then the regime will be solidified under South Korean rule. It's, it's hard to imagine any realistic scenario under which the North can actually invade and hold the South under any realistic scenario. That's just simply not happening. So the question is, when will this happen? Uh, I think that in South Korea, once they realize the cost, sorry, I'll stay right here. Once they realize the cost uh, of East and West German unification, uh, South Koreans got a lot less eager to have it happen soon, which is one of the reasons they are so focused on an interdependent strategy, that taking a bunch of genuinely sort of psychologically traumatized North Koreans and throwing them into the modern world would be very disruptive. Uh, and they see from refugees North Korean refugees in South Korea have an enormously hard time integrating. It is it's shocking. It's, you're taking one of those kids from the, you know, from the 19th century and throwing them into the modern world. So they see the best way to avoid the costs of the East-West German unification as doing it very slowly, and hopefully North Korea over time uh, begins economic reform. They slowly learn about the outside world. Right? Uh, will that happen anytime soon? We have no idea. No idea when that'll happen. My own guess is Kim Jong-il is too firmly in power. It's, not, he, there, it's hard to see regime collapse under Kim Jong-il. The real question, all the betting right now, the parlor games are who's going to take over after him. Every, the first son, the third son, you know, it's all this kind of stuff. And nobody has any idea. Did that answer? Well, how about in comparison to your father? Uh, well, you know, interestingly enough, my, uh, I will tell you a short story. My, 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 my great-grandfather who was the family patriarch, when, when they came south, he said, in my son's lifetime, in my grandson's lifetime, we're never going to see unification. And of course, we're on to now a great-grandson. Uh, you know, I think that the younger generation, here's, here's what the younger generation has that the older generation doesn't have, which is a different view of who, what South Korea is. I think that this, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a conventional wisdom out there that the, the older... North Cor the older South Koreans are very conservative. The younger South Koreans are very naive and progressive. Um, I think that's over overblown in both ways. Uh, opinion polls show that even you know people in their 60s, two thirds support an engagement strategy uh, towards North Korea. Uh, people like my uh, actually the, the 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 church that gave that money is my uncle's church. <laughs> he's like 65, right? <laughs> Every time I go to South Korea, he's like, "You're too liberal." Right? <laughs> And then uh, this last year, I turn around and he's gone to North Korea to give houses to 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 North Koreans. <laughs> what? But it shows the complexity of what it means to be Korean in this type of an environment, where even the most conservative South Koreans can say we have to do something for North Koreans because they're our brothers, right? So I don't think the question of unification is any different. What I do think is different is that I think the younger generation in South Koreans is actually in many ways a little more confident about their ability to be uh, a real country. And I think if you, if you grew up under Japanese occupation, uh, war, liberation, uh, military governments, which many of the older generation did, there was a real view of uh, an almost a, a inferiority complex view of where you fit in the world. Uh, and I think the younger generation has a lot more confidence. Uh, and I think a lot more willingness to say, we're going to do it our way. How about in the back and then how about to the front? Okay, you, you choose. Danielle is in charge. Thank you so much, Professor, for coming and giving us this great talk. Uh, as the six party talks were going on, we had the Israeli uh, jets, you know, bombing this location on the Syrian border, I mean, inside Syria on the yeah. Turkish border. Uh, now we have both the Syrian and Israeli governments confirming that it was bombed. Uh, yeah. Now, there's this whole idea that uh, North Korean scientists might have been killed in. There's this 
it might seem a conspiracy theory that North Korea was hiding its nuclear whatever, you know, away. I mean, I would be very keen to know what do you think. I mean, <laughs> is that... They'll never look there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know... If, if, you, if you, Actually, here's the interesting thing. If, you, if you're interested, the Diane Rehm show this morning was talking about it. Does anybody, did anybody listen to that, Diane Rehm? Did you hear? Oh, okay, right. Uh, so I'm basically going to repeat what I heard there, which is David Sanger, Shibli Talami, and uh, some other guy, like really reputable guys who know about the about, uh, Middle East. Um, David Sanger is the New York Times correspondent. Shibli Talami is the uh, ex-ambassador to whatever something. Um, Anyway, here's what they said, right? I would be really, really surprised if, it was, if North Korea were involved. They didn't say they don't know, because I don't think anybody knows, right? But they said, I'd be very, very surprised. And here's why. There's no question that North Korea gave uh, missile technology to Syria in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, but for both Syria in its current position and North Korea in its current position, to take a chance on this type of an exchange strikes me as wildly foolish, as they both said. Uh, one of them said, as well, Syria has problems even making light bulbs. It's very, you know, for them to be able to make a nuclear uh, uh, facility also seems to be very, very uh, dubious that they could ever do it. They may have gotten plans from North Korea a long time ago and only gotten around to starting it now. Uh, but both of them were highly skeptical that this was an, a current kind of... Uh, cooperation. I haven't heard anything other than that. I do know that it is uh, very convenient timing for a lot of uh, uh, hawks in the U.S. and for hawks in uh, North Korea for something like this to come out uh, because it really throws a wrench into, uh, into a number of the negotiations that are going on. Uh, I have no idea. That's what I heard. Check out the Diane Rehm show for people who know a lot more about the Middle East than me. And then up, up front. Okay, I think you just pretty much covered what I was going to ask, but I'll try to rephrase it. Um, so, the the concern, the U.S. concern that um, the the regime in uh, North Korea would sell, potentially sell nuclear weapons to terrorist organizations, is that a legitimate concern? And how, what, mm -hmm. what level of Confidence. how worried should we be? Or yeah. like, is it is it yeah? Should it is it the key thing that's you know, I've often, I've often wondered about that, right? Because if I was concerned about a country that might actually give weapons to terrorists, I wouldn't be concerned about North Korea. If I was going to be concerned about one country, I'd be concerned about Pakistan, which has a regime that is genuinely, tenuously holding to power, that has known al-Qaeda and terrorists in its borders, that has nuclear weapons and missiles and everything else, right? If I'm worried right now about a country... I'm far more worried about what's going on in Pakistan than I am in North Korea, where it's very clear the regime is in control. They have, an, they have a commercial relationship with a number of uh, 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 unsavory uh, Middle Eastern regimes like Libya and Syria. Uh, but they've also said very clearly that they're not, they have no intention of exporting North Korean uh, nuclear technology or weapons. So, so there's no known connection between the Kim Jong-il... The known connection goes through Pakistan and the AQ Khan network. What, what essentially happened is like the, the connection that we've got is A.Q. Khan, this, this Pakistani nuclear physicist, uh, was essentially running a, you know, basically a sort of a, a shop or whatever you want to call it, you know, a bazaar, uh, a bookmobile, where he'd go around all these different countries and sell whatever he could. So he, he, his fingerprints are in Malaysia, they're in North Korea, uh, they're in Libya and other places. But it's basically through A.Q. Khan that we think that this happened as opposed to a North Korea sending stuff out. Right. Uh, you know, is there is there a concern that they would that they would proliferate? Yes. Uh, one of the interesting things is if they have six to eight bombs, it's probably highly unlikely that they will proliferate because that's very very low numbers, and they've already used up one. So when one of the jokes that went around D.C. last year is, what do we, what's our response when North Korea tests one nuke? Get them to test another one. <laughs> you know, uh, because that way they'll get rid of them all. Right. Because we know that they don't have more plutonium than basically enough to make eight bombs. So it would be far more likely if there was 50 bombs and they could afford to give away one or two. Sorry, I, I hate to keep or following seven. up like this. But um, <laughs> uh, do you think that they look, uh, they, sorry, um, Kim Jong-il looks at the United States more as how can I benefit from the United States or is it more how can I, I mean, it Avoid seems like what costs. you've been talking about is 
that um, the economic benefits for North Korea would outweigh any, you know, proliferation or anything against the United States? Well, I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing is, like, one of the things the North Koreans said earlier on in, like, 1999 was, the reason we sell uh, missile technology is that's basically the only thing that anyone will buy from us. And when, in the late 90s, as the Clinton regime was ending, the, the U.S. and North Korea came very, very close to signing an agreement over missiles. We had made an agreement over the nuclear weapons, but we hadn't made an agreement over the missiles. Two interesting points about that. The first one is North Korea didn't ask for money in exchange for uh, stopping its missile exports. They didn't say, all right, how much? You know, how much are you going to give me? Which is what we typically think that North Korea does. They said, we understand you've got concerns. What we want to be able to do then is sell other things abroad because we need cash. So much of the discussion with the United States was not over a payment in amount. It was over how to get opening to markets, how to increase investment and things like that. You can actually go back. It's very interesting. It wasn't a, okay, here we're doing something bad, pay us. The second thing is they, they put a voluntary moratorium on missile testing in 99. They said, okay, we know that you guys are worried, so we will stop testing missiles uh, and we'll work something out. Uh, they held that up until this year for seven years. And I remember in 2002, people were saying, uh, they won't keep it, right? And eventually they, they stopped. It was a voluntary moratorium, you know, and they, then they tested most likely to try and you know, show the U.S. what they were doing. So in terms of, in terms of do, they, do they view the U.S. more as economic benefit or, or threat, you know, I think any regime is primarily concerned with survival first and foremost. And in that sense, this goes back to that question of do they feel threatened or not. If they, if they do feel threatened, all this economic stuff is going to be secondary to how do we actually ensure the survival of our regime. Because at some point, right now, I think what Kim Jong-il has is a series of really bad choices. And it's a mistake to give him either too much uh, omnip um, omnipotence or you know, omniscience in terms of knowing what to do. Both domestic politics and international politics have not gone North Korea's way in the last two decades. They have gotten worse and worse and worse. And so what he's trying to do is balance a very difficult ruling situation of a declining economy, people who are starving, and an external environment that is highly threatening to him. And in that environment, I think that the, the search for uh, ways to relieve that pressure, either by, you know, what they started to do in the 90s was try and talk about a peace treaty with the United States, you know, which would resolve an awful lot of their concerns. Um, you know, does that get there? Yeah. Okay. Somebody, somebody over here had their all right, hand up. No? Over here then, Daniela? This may be unanswerable. It goes in motivation, I suppose. But, but I noticed that it's taken almost seven years for us to get back to the point where we were when Kim Dae Jung went to visit Bush yeah. during his first, uh, you know, as his first foreign recipient, and the disasters that felt that that followed. And then in 2005, the Treasury Department seems to have just about single-handedly torpedoed uh, an yeah. agreement, which seems to me that the the same momentum was there in the administration. So the fact that we are back now, is that a result of gradually, very slowly, really, really slowly learning something? Or is it simply, there's Iraq and there's Iran, we have no choice but to deal because we couldn't do anything anyway? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. It gets to the, the domestic politics side in the US, right? Uh, my friend Victor would give you a very different story. Right, the, 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 the party line from the Bush administration is we, we've been consistent the whole way, we've been testing their intentions, and now we're ready to move. And I, I frankly don't buy that at all. Right? Uh, in fact, he's got an article coming out in Foreign Affairs where he basically says that. You know, everything's been consistent.